Um, morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Introduction to Development. Uh, my name is Leif Madsen. Uh, I'm going to be kind of emceeing uh, this morning. Uh, we have uh, five uh, developers coming up uh, throughout the next three hours that'll be going through various parts of uh, Asterisk development, and we'll start at um, community and move our way up, and uh, at the end, there'll be some API presentations and stuff like that. So hopefully you'll um, come out with uh, some really good things th uh, this morning. Uh, each presenter has about 30 minutes to talk with about five minutes within that time to uh, answer some questions and stuff. Um, if maybe I think we'll let all the presenters actually do their full slides and maybe try to take questions at the end. Um, that way the presenter is able to keep going and make sure they get all the information out uh, you know, before, before we start taking questions. So um, we're going to start with Paul. He's a software developer at Digium, and uh, he's basically the uh, testing uh, developer. He works with the test suite quite a bit, and uh, he's going to talk about uh, community interaction and, and how um, Asterisk and the community work together. Thank you. That applause. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to keep this pretty lighthearted. It's some of this might be, you know, common sense to everybody. Some of this might be your first interaction with Asterisk. But basically, we're just going to go through everything. Um, you know, I'll start my slides, but um, like starting with asterisk.org. So basically, this is the focal point of Asterisk, where you get, I would say, the majority of your information. Uh, everything from uh, our tarball releases that uh, Life does. Uh, we also have packages for uh, Red Hat, uh, CentOS combined, and then we also provide uh, Debian and Ubuntu packages. Those are new this year. Um, we also have links and information to Subversion, which is the uh, version control software we use for development. Uh, later on in the slides, we'll go into some of the tools, not necessarily the tools, but the locations of the tools. That's another presentation that, that I think Matt's going to be doing. Um, so basically, if you've never been to asterisk.org, I don't know where you're getting your copy of asterisk. But, um, <laughs> but basically, there's asterisk. There's asterisk now, which is the uh, sent to us packages. And I believe it's free PBX and uh, the asterisk GUI option. There's the dotty stuff that Russell is going to talk, or not Russell, that uh, is going to be talking about. Um, there's going to be, yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, there's libpri, there's libss7, all that's down there. Um, like I said, there's portal. It's the portal for the information for resources. So there's also training information, training guides, online training. That's something new that uh, Digium released this year, as well as Switchbox information, if you're interested in the business side of it. Um, aside from that, there's also wiki.asterisk.org. That's relatively new. It, la it launched last year at Astrocon. Um, so over the last 12 months, we've been putting both asterisk and asterisk SCF information on there. So it's kind of separated out into two specific projects. Um, lots of documentation on the site. Um, most of it's generated directly from source. Um, if you're not aware, um, we, all the functions and applications, they have documentation actually in the asterisk source that you can use core show application dial or core show function caller ID. All that information is extracted via a bot and uploaded up to the wiki. Um, as well, there's some personal spaces, some blogs, um, brain dumps, basically I go in there and just dump all the stuff that I'm working on for a place that I need to store it. Um, basically, it's public read, public comments, but it's private edits. And uh, the reason we did that is we wanted to kind of control the quality of uh, articles and information. Now, if that's something that you're interested in doing, providing documentation, I'm sure life will love it. Um, all you have to do is just ask for commit, not necessarily commit access, but write access, edit access. 
and we're more than happy to get you in there involved adding documentation um, installation guides you know everything along that lines <clears throat> so basically hopefully one way or another everybody's used asterisk at some point in time um, there's probably some new developers or seasoned developers but basically for this talk I'm gonna break it up into three three types of people that use asterisk there's the asterisk user, which is either a newcomer, a system administrator, an integrator, a consultant, you know, somebody that kind of loves asterisk or wants to get into it, um, not very strong in development. Uh, the second type is an actual programmer. Hopefully some of you are here or, or wanting to become. Um, so those are not only programmers, but somebody like myself, which is a tester, quality assurance, product, quality, uh, bug marshals like Life, or anybody else who likes to submit bugs that they found for their or their customers. Um, and then there's the commercial and business user. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about that. That's just, I'm just going to kind of in passing. So that's not really the purpose of this, these, uh, these slides. But companies that use Asterisk as a product or they sell software add-ons. <coughs> So primarily, one of the major things we use is IRC. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically real-time chat. Um, so we reside on Freenode, IRC Freenode, and we have about um, 13 channels. Uh, these are just kind of a snapshot, but there's, on top of this that I get to in a second, there's asterisk documentation, um, asterisk now, you know, they're kind of directed towards what they pertain to. So um, it's hard to see. I, for, I didn't clear my cache here. I'm, I'm using a different laptop because mine's broken. But um, there's kind of, I, um, Freenode has a kind of frequently asked questions section, how to register your username, how to connect different clients, so on and so forth. I'm not going to go into that. There's a link. Once I give my presentation at the end, you can kind of follow. Uh, for an asterisk user, uh, pound asterisk is probably the place you want to be. If you've not been there, you want to go there. There's lots of smart people in there, lots of people who just like giving help at zero cost. So if, you know, you're not really an a-hole about it, right? You know, they, they really love you. Um, Asterisk Bugs is a good place. That's usually where myself and uh, life kind of hang out. Primarily used for um, if you have a bug or you want to kind of get the status of a bug or you want to help with another bug. Anything bug related obviously goes on that channel. Uh, asterisk Testing, relatively new. It's something that I just kind of popped up one day last year. And the concept of that is, is we get into it a little bit more, our test frameworks, unit tests. Um, that's where you kind of go to get some information. You want to use the test suite to kind of write your own tests or, um, you know, just interested in developing it with it. Um, developers, you'll want to go in asterisk dev. There's about 55 people that kind of hang out there. Most of Digium hangs out there. There's a lot of community developers. Uh, Copaz, I just seen, he kind of, I think he sits in there and he's a good guy to get working for you, you know. Um, and then another one that I don't know if people know about is asterisk commits. <clears throat> so when we actually do a commit to subversion, it gets to the outputs to this channel. So it's a, a great way to see what's going on in real time when people are actually committing patches to the branches, which we get into in a, in a couple more slides. Um, so the next level is mailing lists. They're another great tool, not real time obviously, you're dealing with email, but um, I was supposed to have actual numbers, but I, unfortunately I didn't get that information. But um, it's managed by Digium, lists.digium.com. Uh, there's approximately 37 lists, everything from Dottie, um, SS7, uh, high availability, um, you name it, there's probably a list for it. Um, that was established 2003. 
all that's archived, so you can go back and look at it. Google's a great tool to search through it. Um, again, Asterisk users, great list. Lots of people on there. You have problems. Um, no commercial stuff. You know, you really have a problem with Asterisk. You want to put it there. Um, another one, if you're a user, you want to go into Asterisk announcements, Asterisk security. Uh, developers, for, you know, everybody here. If you're not, register or you should be part of the asterisk development mailing list. This is actually only deals with development of asterisk. So if you're trying to use asterisk and oh my SIP here doesn't work and um, here's a SIP trace, you're going to hopefully be kindly told to go to another list. Um, if not, you should kindly tell somebody to go to another list. Um, and then another good one to monitor is uh, SVN commits. Again, it's another tool to help you watch what's going on in Asterisk development. Um, basically, if you see something in a commit message that, or a commit that you're concerned about or you don't like or whatever, people will reply to that commit to the mailing list to bring out conversations about it, either because you didn't know the commit was going in or for whatever reason you just kind of missed out on it. So that, that's a really good one to keep a track with. Um, yeah, sorry, it's kind of hard to see. Hopefully you can. Um, these, I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Um, this is more user stuff. Again, Asterisk Forms, it's kind of an offshoot. I really don't know who manages that. I think some community members, but uh, I, I don't go there too much. Asterisk Exchange is a pay-click kind of concept. You put your product up there. Um, Asterisk Forge is a repository for third party. Um, Asterisk, for, for whatever reason, either due to licensing or um, the developer kind of want to maintain more control, gets put up here. Um, the only one that I can think of off the top of my head is Darren Sessions. Uh, he works at Digium, but he also deals with App Swift. And I think the reason he put it up here was because of some licensing concerns. And then there's Twitter, which is Twitter. Um, everybody's got that. Is there any questions so far? I mean, I know Life said we'll take it at the end, but if anybody has a question, feel free to speak up or put your hand. <coughs> so a, a great tool if you're looking to do development or get into development is our bug tracker or our issue tracker. Basically, issues.asterisk.org and um, Kind of some excitement of it this year. We migrated from Mantis into Jira, which is basically uh, another another tool now. Um, internally, Jira has been used by Digium for a while. I don't know the exact number. I think it's maybe about four or five years. Yeah. So there were some mechanical processes between Mantis and Jira, which were kind of a pain in the butt. And this was to help that. Um, the move was actually done on 2000, I'm sorry, uh, June 28th, 2011 by Erin Spicelin, but I think she probably did two months worth of work on it, and the main goal was to actually preserve the, the history of the original Mantis by importing all the commits, or all the issues, patches, um, commit messages, history, uh, and actually get it into JIRA. And uh, it actually went went quite well. I mean, there was lots of internal testing for it, uh, so lots of hiccups internally, but I think externally, once we moved to it, it went pretty smooth. I mean, just like anything that you cut over, there's going to be some inherent problems, but um, those are still being worked out. <coughs> Mantis still exists. It's a great resource to kind of go back and look through the history, but it's... <coughs> Excuse me. It's read only. Um, I think the plan is just to keep it there indefinitely until somebody just doesn't want to maintain it anymore. But uh, a great place. Um, now here's where we get to the fun stuff. There's actually over 800 open issues on the tracker. So um, I remember an ex uh, something I think Russell said is that. Uh, Somebody hopped on and said, well, why is there over 800 issues? And, well, it's a sign of a, a healthy, active project. People are, you know, using it, finding, sure, there's problems, but 
you know, 800 issues, we don't see it as a downside. We see it as a lot of people are using it and as such, they find problems. So um, that's life's main, that's what life does. He just triages issues and all that good stuff. Uh, I, help, I help out it a little bit, but um, the process of collecting information is usually the most time consuming. So if you do have a problem, um, you know, it's kind of the next section is have an issue that's great, report it. It goes a long way if you can actually have somebody else, either in your company or in the community, actually confirm or reproduce it, then that's just more information we can look at. Um, we have some can responses, and um, if it's kind of a cold response, it's not because we are cold and calculative, you know, it's, um, we just have lots of bugs to get through. And sometimes it's just like, some of the bad ones are asterisk crashes, and we're just like, thanks for reporting that. It's fantastic. Um, but um, submit backtraces, which is another talk that's gonna get in there. Config files, I mean, if it's related to SIP, a SIP trace is fantastic. Something that somebody who's not necessarily a developer can kind of go look into that issue and say, yeah, I think I know where the problem is and then it can actually get pointed towards a developer so the developer doesn't have to waste time and energy looking through that information and trying to actually figure out, okay, well, this is a bug or this is just a configuration issue. That's primarily how the triage process works. And then from there, there's some more workflow. I mean, we might talk about it at the end here if we have a little bit more time. Uh, there's also patches on Jira, like patches that are done Feature, feature complete stuff that just needs testing. So if you're a developer and you're looking to get into it, um, just find an issue with a patch attached to it, merge it in and just start testing with it. And if there, chances are there may be problems, chances are there's not. I mean, chances are the patch just doesn't even apply. So if you're knowledgeable in diffing, creating diffs and you know resolving conflicts, I mean, that's fantastic. Just download it, merge it, clean it up, submit it again. I mean, that goes a long way. Uh, and then, like I said, if you found an issue, have somebody else confirm it, that helps. Provide uh, as much information as you can. If you can submit a patch, that, that goes a long way. Um, but probably the biggest thing is just patience. I mean, there's a lot a lot of stuff up there. So I understand everybody's bug is important to everybody and you might have customers that are on you about it, but it's a give and take. So just be patient. If it's really critical to you, then you probably want to go out and find somebody in the community to do work for you. And that usually involves payment of some sort. But if, they, if, if you pay to get it fixed, then please submit it upstream so somebody else doesn't have to, right? Um, so some other tools that we use is um, Review Board. It's basically a community-driven uh, review process. So it's, it's a tool that works in conjunction with JIRA. So if you're going to submit a patch for a new feature, uh, please don't directly send it to Review Board. Create an issue saying it's a new feature and then upload your information to Review Board. Um, like I said, last time I checked, which was Friday, there's 120 open reviews, which again basically means code is ready to get merged. Um, it just needs review, and that could be a simple uh, code review, which is making sure that if statements have braces, spacing is proper. Um, you know, it may require some more high level or low level skills. Um, channel locking and so on. Again, there's another talk going into that in more detail. Um, but it's a, it's a great way to learn how Asterisk operates. I mean, I'm not the best programmer in Asterisk. Uh, like I said, I'm into automated testing and dealing with Asterisk. Hopefully it's already you know working properly and if it crashes, then that, my job is a success. But it's a great way to learn about 
you know, certain areas. I mean, some of the stuff that I've, I've been recently working on is just how configuration file parsing has worked. And um, those patches are up on review board. And just that process of going through that, we kind of figured out that some of that is not really cool how we do it. And yesterday, we just had a talk at the DevCon about maybe changing how we parse configuration files and all that. So it's, it's a good way to get in. If, you're, if you don't know where to start, just review board is a great place to kind of see who's done work, maybe find something that you're interested in. Maybe there's a patch in it. You know, the ChanSip, voicemail, you know, lots of stuff. Locking, that's some more specialty. I think Dave's going to talk about that. Um, we also deal with automated testing. That's relatively new. Um, over the last 18 months or so, um, I have a talk on it on Thursday. I'm not going to go too, too much into it because that's my next presentation. But basically, the concept is, is every time we do a commit uh, into the trees or into the branches, um, we, use, we utilize Bamboo, which is a continuous integ integration tool. Uh, so that will detect the um, change in subversion. And then it goes out and it will build asterisk, compile it with some development flags, verify asterisk compiles. Um, if it doesn't, it fires off a lot of annoying messages to me. Um, so that on for myself is really bad because if I go away from my desktop and it's a really active afternoon and something's broken I literally have like 50 emails saying you know this patch is broken it just doesn't even compile and that could be because of some extra development flags we toggle to um, break on warnings compiler warnings so um, like I said, so we have plans, we have multiple agents, we deal with um, Ubuntu, uh, CentOS, Mac OS, FreeBSD, free and then we run, once that's done, we then check out the automated testing tool, which will fire up multiple asterisk instances and talk back and forth to each other. Doing everything from transfers, blind transfers, DTMF transfers, um, some voicemail stuff that Matt's been doing, which is pretty cool stuff. Um, yeah, that's kind of a really cool thing to get into. So if you're going to be getting into development, um, I would love if you can write a test at the same time to validate some of the development work you've been doing. And, and that would be a big plus for me to help encourage you to get your code committed. So if there's two people, then they, they both have patches and one has a test and one doesn't. I'll probably steer towards the guy with a test and go, hey, let's get this guy in because it's going to help everybody. <clears throat> and then aside from that, uh, we have another kind of repository called Repo Tools. And um, in this repository, it, it basically has everything related to the, to the process of managing asterisk and asterisk releases. Um, I got a couple minutes here, I think. Life's got a slide that talks about the process of how we create a release candidate. Um, it probably comes up once a week, you know. How my bug is fixed and it's closed. Why wasn't the code put into this version of Asterisk? So it's, it's not as simple as that, but um, yeah, we got a couple minutes here if you wanted to kind of explain how it, how it works. So yeah, I, uh, I do essentially the uh, release process uh, for asterisk. And this is a slightly older picture. Just replace four with the number eight in your brain, and it's pretty much the exact same thing. So we have a branch, let's say the 1.8 branch. And within that, changes get merged into that branch. And that's always progressing forward. When we do a release, we do a release candidate, so RC1. And an RC1 is essentially a snapshot from that branch and that goes into uh, a package and people can start testing it. While that release candidate is, is, is out there ready for testing, there's still changes going on in the branch. So within the branch, let's say there was a bug fixed after that RC1. Well, when we do RC2, 3x up until the release, what we do is we take the RC1 and we copy it into, say, RC2, and then we make the specific changes or merge in the changes from the branch that 
we deem need to go in for that release candidate. So let's say there was a release candidate and there was some sort of a regression, a small regression that caused some, say call parking stopped working for some reason uh, within uh, some, someone's uh, framework. So we fix that, it gets merged into the branch and from there, then we take the RC1, we copy that, so essentially RC2 is exactly the same as RC1, and then we merge that specific change into the RC2, and from there, and then we release RC2. And then that process keeps going, and let's say RC2 was the last, we, we deemed RC2, there's no other regressions, there's no other issues that were caused from that snapshot. We then copy, say, RC2 into the full release tag. So, so the full, let's say in this case, 1431, was based on 1431RC2. 1431 is exactly the same as RC2. There's no additional changes. So the last RC gets just directly copied, and then that becomes the release. So knowing that, that there's a time between when RC1 was a snapshot from the branch, and we, we take that process and merge in specific things into the additional RCs, that's why when an issue is fixed after the RC1, you won't see it in the next release. So the releases technically comes after the fix was put into the branch, but because it wasn't fixed prior to the RC1, which was the snapshot from, from the branch, that's why you won't see that fix until the next RC1. So only RC1s are snapshots from the branch, which is basically everything from the prior RC1, and then that releases within the, RC, within the release candidate process. There's very minor changes that fix specific things um, prior to release. Um, any questions on that? I must have done a really good job. Um, any other questions for Paul? Yeah, there's like at least 300 of those issues that are open. Yeah, you can't just assume, there's 800 issues open, but not all of them are technically bugs. Some of them are enhancements to additional code, some are new features, some are, like some are actually, you know, obviously issues, but some of them are, are fairly old and are waiting on, you know, on people to provide feedback and things like that. So um, I would say there's maybe actually 300 of those are active issues that, you know, we'll get triage and actually, you know, reviewed and worked on and things like that. Uh, earlier you were mentioning that there was a mailing list uh, for uh, uh, Dottie. Uh, do you have similar names? Because I can only find one who's called Dottie Commit and nothing for just saying such a good issue. Uh, the question was, is um, the Dottie mailing lists? Aside from Dottie commits, the gentleman was asking what other mailing lists are available. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So. Yep. Yeah, some of them are not monitored too much. So if you really, if you got a question on there that's you think important and it's been two months and you haven't heard anything, feel free to put it on Asterisk Dev. That one's really active, and there's lots of different developers on there. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, that process is kind of really dependent on, oh, so the question was, what's the process that we do to build CentOS packages and Debian and Ubuntu packages? Um, it's kind of managed by two people. I, I deal with the Debian side of things. Jason Parker, I'm not sure if he's in here. Uh, yeah, hand up. He deals on the CentOS side. Um, at least on the Debian side, uh, we roll not only releases, so 1870, We'll also release in a different branch, a proposed branch, 1880RC1. So on the Debian side, you can run the stable stuff, the release stuff, 
or you can also try out the RC stuff. I don't think the, the, the RPMs do that. They just primarily deal on the, um, the release versions of Asterisk. But Jason also does a lot more stuff. He deals with dotty pot packages, um, free PBX. The Debian side's pretty thin on what we, what we package. Yeah, so the question was, is on the, uh, specifically I think on the, the Debian and Ubuntu side, the Dottie stuff. Um, we actually don't do any Dottie stuff. We rely on the OS version. And that's only because when I, we were tasked with the sprint, we just wanted to get the Astra stuff out the door. Now, there's been a couple requests to bump Dottie. Um, and in fact, in Lucid, we backported from Maverick because there was some build issues with 1.8. But um, it's probably something we could do. Um, ideally, we don't want to maintain our own version and provide support to it and rely on the OS. I mean, it would probably be better if we took the time and energy to have the OS version backported in Ubuntu or Debian because we're really not applying any custom patches. It's specifically for the, the Dottie stuff. I, I just rebuilt it. I didn't do any work to it. On the Asterisk stuff, which Zephyr um, is probably maintained for the Debian side, uh, we do a little bit things differently. We don't want to kind of have custom patches or um, you know, bug fixes in the packet. We want to be it as clean as possible so that somebody could actually go on the issue tracker and say, hey, I used it from here. And we kind of know it's a sanitized version as much as possible. So there, there are some custom patches in there for the build process. But uh, to, to answer your question is, it could be done, it's just nobody, it's not been tasked, and I guess if people want it, open up an issue and round up some buddies, and if I get some time, we can, we can backport it. So, sorry, that's, we have to move on to the next presenter, but Paul can talk. Yeah, I mean. Like, we can talk outside and. There's, yeah. Uh, there'll be a break, and, so remember your question. Yes, thank you. So David Vossel is next, and uh, he'll be presenting on asterisk architecture. It's weird, weird holding a mic. I feel like I should be like walking around motivating people or something. Or Uh, I, th I think we gave this one already, um, so I, I'll, I'll pick another one. That's a great idea. Um, I just need to go to my flash oh. drive, oh. wherever that is. Pen drive there. Sorry, I double clicked on the wrong one. <laughs> How do you? Already. So I am David Vossel, and I'm going to tell you guys about Asterisk Architecture. Um, I work at Digium, by the way, and uh, I contribute quite a bit to the, the Asterisk project. Um, so what is, what, a little bit? <laughs> a little bit? OK. So what is the Asterisk Core? Um, the Asterisk Core is a tool set. Um, so what does that even mean? Uh, well, tools let you build stuff, like buildings or robots or flying machines but uh, the tools themselves don't really do anything except sit there and look like tools um, so similar to tools doing nothing the asterisk core doesn't really do anything um, i mean you can look at the cli and uh, type in a bunch of commands and see how many channels you don't have but uh, that's really about it um, so given that what is the actual purpose of the asterisk core? Um, the asterisk core contains all the glue that allows us to run dial plan and bridge calls. Well, it, it does some other stuff as well. Um, 
I guess. But it's uh, so it contains all the ab ab abstractions that we use for things like ass frames or the messaging framework or um, event framework and uh, all this other stuff that just kind of represents what data should look like. But none of that lets us actually make a call. Um, it's just kind of abstractions that live out there that we need to implement. Okay, got it. Astra's core is a tool set. So at the most basic level, what do we need to make a call? So basically, we want to fill in this picture. We have two phones, and then there's just some magic stuff that goes on that lets you talk. Um, so first off, we're going to need some modules. So most of the modules in Asterisk are going to fall into five categories. Uh, we have channel drivers, which handle the network side of things. They're, they're going to live in the edge of Asterisk that connect you to your SIP endpoints, or your analog endpoints, or your EX endpoints, or, or whatever. Um, we have dial plan applications, which after you've connected to that remote endpoint, you actually want to do something with it, ideally. So dial plan applications are the things that run your dial plan that you know you go through and answer a call or dial it and send a channel to all these different applications to do stuff. Uh, dial plan functions are modules that let you set kind of attributes on a channel. So you want to set uh, the volume on a channel, or you want to set some sort of channel variable on uh, the channel that affects behavior in some way. Um, you're going to use dial plan functions, and that's in the dial plan as well. Um, codec translators, those are modules that let you um, translate between media formats. So if you have ALAW and ULAW, you're going to have a codec translator module that you load up that lets you build that translation path. Uh, and resource modules, it's kind of our miscellaneous category. Um, it contains all kinds of just random stuff. Um, we have like a RTP engine lives there. We have um, a stun monitor that lives there that lets you detect like the state of your network. Um, a bunch of other stuff. Calendaring lives in there. Um, it's a cool place. So at a minimum, we need two modules to bridge a call. Um, we need Asterisk Core, of course, which isn't really a module, but on top of that, we need uh, a channel driver, um, something to connect to our telephony endpoint, and a dial plan application um, of some sort for that endpoint to talk to. So let's start by talking what a channel driver is. The concept of uh, the Asterisk channel is probably the single most important thing you guys can get out of this talk. Um, so that kind of makes it a big deal. Um, the Asterisk channel um, is a connection between Asterisk and some other telephony endpoint, such as uh, a SIP phone. And if we're looking at this picture, the Asterisk channel is going to live there. Uh, so it's on the edge of Asterisk, and it's the connection to the, the endpoints there that then feed all the stuff into the Asterisk magic. So in order for all telephony endpoints to interact with Asterisk and Asterisk core the same way, all channel drivers have to implement uh, the Asterisk Core's channel tech abstraction. And all this is is a set of functions that you want your telephony endpoint to do, um, but you don't want the Asterisk Core to have to know about the protocol specifics behind, behind how, how they necessarily work. So for instance, ChanSIP is going to implement read, write, send, send DTMF, answer, and hangout, which are all telephony actions, but the Asterisk Core doesn't need to know, oh, this is a ChanSIP channel, so I have to send you know, a buy here or anything like that. It just says hang up. And uh, the, the channel driver takes care of um, actually doing the protocol sp specific stuff behind that. So by strafting out all the network endpoints to a generic Asterisk channel, the Asterisk Core is capable of treating all endpoints the exact same. So that means Asterisk Core, if you can look at these arrows, there, there's nothing bypassing read to SIP read. You have to, the Asterisk Core just sees read. It doesn't have to know that there's a SIP read behind that. Um, and uh, let's see. OK, so in the same way, Asterisk Core doesn't have to know uh, how to bridge EECS and SIP differently. It just has to know, OK, well, these are two Asterisk channels. They both, you know, the channel drivers underneath them both implement the same channel tech abstraction. So the Asterisk Core just knows, all right, well, I've got two channels. I need to bridge stuff in between them. And uh, uh, channel techs take care of all the protocol specific stuff. Um, yeah, that's what I just said. So channel tech gives Asterisk a ton of power. Uh, because of the channel tech abstraction, we can develop an application like ConfBridge or MeetMe or anything like that. And uh, any 
channel or any telephony protocol can interact with it that implements the channel, uh, AST channel abstraction. Uh, this means that any application you write is going to work with any telephony endpoint that AstroSari supports and even protocols that don't even exist yet, which is uh, why Astros has been around for a while because we can keep on adapting. Um, okay, you guys got it. Channel drivers connect to telephony endpoints and implement the channel tech abstraction. So what happens with the channel after it is created? All inbound channels or calls are sent to the dial plan. Um, this is where telephony endpoints interact with the dial plan applications, which are the modules we discussed earlier, and dial plan functions. So looking at the categories we listed earlier, we're talking about these two. Um, so in this example, um, that's some dial plan under there. Uh, a channel is going to be sent to the dial plan. It's going to uh, do these three uh, functions. It's going to do answer, which is a dial plan application, playback, which is going to playback something about weasels to the channel, which is kind of useless, and then it's going to hang up the channel. Um, so those are three applications that get sent, the channel gets sent to. Um, yeah, so dial plan applications can really do anything to a channel that a channel is capable of doing. Uh, so it's going to be responsible for stuff like putting it into a conference or a call queue or uh, using the dial plan or the dial application to actually originate another call out, um, outbound. Okay, so let's walk through this example line by line. Um, instead, let's go back to talking about what Asterisk needs to make and bridge a call. Um, so we're going back to this picture of the magic stuff. Uh, and we've, uh, we've gone over three concepts uh, that will let us fill in this picture. We have the Asterisk core for running dial plan and loading modules, uh, the channel driver for establishing remote endpoint connections, and dial plan applications, uh, giving those remote connections something to talk to. So filling in the picture. We have channel drivers. We're going to use chan sip and chan eeks. And um, they're going to talk. Well, there's an inbound. I don't know, we'll say there's an inbound call coming from uh, the, the sip phone, and it's going to go to dial and originate the outbound call to uh, the eeks endpoint. Uh, so we're going to use the dial application for that. Um, so if we've gotten this far. Let's talk about what's going on here. Um, so this picture kind of progresses us to the next important topic, uh, channel bridging. Um, channel bridging is a code that transfers media and signaling between one call leg and the other. Um, just like network transactions are abstracted by the channel tech, uh, media is going to be abstracted by the AST frame. So things like audio are, are all packed into this generic representation that any AST channel um, can, can consume and then spit out on the network side through the, the channel tech. Um, same thing with signaling, um, like hold and unhold and things like that and get abstracted into AST frames. Um, so there's two types of bridging. There's the generic bridging, which is the picture that we've been looking at right here, where everything's abstracted to, to the asterisk channel and, and you know, eeks can talk to SIP and all that cool stuff. But there's also uh, the idea of native bridging, where if we have, you know, if asterisk detects that we have a, a SIP channel tech, and another SIP channel tech that we're trying to bridge together, then, well, there's kind of a shortcut there. I mean, they're both SIP. So um, we can get away with not having to do the actual frame abstraction and just do the straight um, SIP to SIP uh, bridging, which is a lot more efficient and makes a lot more sense um, when you can actually do it. So let's move on to talking about asterisk use of threads. Before we do that, does anyone have any questions about what I've gone over so far? Is everybody awake? Cool. Um, so discussing asterisk use of threads. Um, so asterisk is highly multi-threaded. We use threads for all kinds of stuff. Um, so looking at this picture, um, we have a couple of threads involved. We have uh, two monitor threads, which is going to be reading stuff off the network. Uh, they're going to live in the uh, channel driver. So in this case, we have a do monitor thread and chan sip, which is going to be reading stuff off the network and sending stuff. And same thing with eeks. And uh, those key frames to the PBX thread. And that's the one that actually pushes channels through the dial plan. So that's the one that's actually going to um, get the channel, throw it into dial, and originate the outbound call. And uh, the network threads are actually queuing frames to be read by the PBX thread. Um, 
we use threads for a lot of other things as well, but um, we can talk about that outside of this because it gets, it gets really complicated. Uh, but those are the two major uses uh, of threads. Um, okay, we'll go on the code translation. Um, so what happens if two telephony endpoints uh, don't speak the same codec? Can they be bridged? So in this uh, diagram we have uh, one channel is trying to speak a law and another one is trying to speak G722 and that's just not going to work because it's just going to sound like gibberish. Um, but how do we handle that? Uh, and this is where codec translation takes place. Um, so the translation modules uh, sit in the audio stream and detect, okay, well, this channel wants G722, this one wants a law. Let's see if there's some way we can build a translation path in between these two so they can speak the same code hack. So they're going to sit in the stream. In this case, we have an a law G722 translation and G722 to a law uh, translation taking place. Yeah, they let you talk to each other. Okay, so every time a new codec module is loaded, translation model, we actually um, implement this, uh, this kind of matrix that includes every possible translation path and optimizes it and all this cool stuff. Um, and Asterisk is getting a lot smarter about how it does that. Um, they're, they're built, the translation paths are built in a way that actually preserves quality at this point. So, you know, G722 is 16 kilohertz, and uh, Siren 17 is another codec, 16 kilohertz. Uh, the translation path between G722 and Siren, um, Asterisk is going to know, okay, well, I want to go through G722 to Siren Linear, which is a lossless co um, format, uh, to Siren 7, which preserves the 16 kilohertz um, sample rate. Um, I mean, it's possible that G722 could go through 8 kilohertz Siren Linear, but Asterisk is smart enough to know that that's probably a stupid idea, so it won't do that. Um, so we can guarantee that sample rate is preserved. Um, so on the topic of media, media let's, uh, let's talk about audio hooks a little bit. Um, some applications need to sit on a channel and watch as audio passes, um, like mix monitor. We want to record a call, we want something that can sit out there and have a call back to the media streams and, and receive everything that's being read and uh, written to a channel, um, in this case to record it. Um, so the audio hook API uh, allows applications to register a callback in order to receive a copy of all the media uh, traversing a channel. Um, besides just reading audio, um, we can also do some stuff um, that manipulates the audio. So in this example, uh, we can have a pitch shift audio hook that actually sits in the stream and it gets all the frames and manipulates them and raises the pitch and makes you sound funny. Um, and that just, uh, the audio hook just hooks in there and um, as frames are being read, it you know, pitches it and spits them out the other side. Um, a more practical use for that would be like raising uh, or lowering volume. If you want to do volume adjustments, audio hooks make a whole lot of sense for that. Um, besides audio hooks, um, there's some other uh, APIs out there that let you hook into the streams on a channel uh, in a more generic way. And that's where uh, the frame hook API comes into play. Um, we can actually register a callback with the Framehook API to receive any frame read or written to a channel. Not just audio, it could be video, audio, text, signaling, absolutely anything. And, and that gives us a lot of uh, really cool functionality because um, it, it let us do things like implement the T38 gateway. Since Framehooks are generic, um, we can take, um, you know, T38 was it UDPTL frames or whatever and turn it to a T30 um, audio frames, I'm not sure how it works exactly, but I know that uh, frame hooks actually allow us to do that because it's generic. Same thing with gear buffering. Um, we can actually capture the audio as it's coming in, stick it in this buffer and reorder it and all this stuff and hold it until we actually want to, uh, to send it out at the proper time or proper interval. And um, before that, we really didn't have a way of doing that. We, gear buffering is actually uh, something we just implemented um, well in Asterisk 10. It's been around for a while, but it was always on the wrong side of a channel. Now we actually have it on the read side of a channel, uh, which allows it to be used in things like conferencing and, and stuff like that, which uh, in conferencing, getting rid of your jitter is kind of a big deal because uh, there's no way of doing it after it enters the conference. Um, all right, let's talk about media formats. Media formats used to be represented by a single bit in asterisk. Uh, you would have things like uh, ULAW, ALAW, and G722, they would be a single bit, and that's okay because 
Um, those formats don't really have a whole lot of information associated with them. I mean, ULaw has a constant bit rate, a, comp a constant sample rate, and uh, there's not really anything that can change about that. I mean, if you know how big your ULaw frame is, then you can calculate the sample or um, how many samples are in it and everything that you need because it's just always going to be the exact same. Um, that doesn't really hold true for like video uh, formats or some of the more complex uh, audio formats like Silk or Opus or Kelt. Um, so with H.264, which is a video codec, um, it, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to represent with a single bit. Um, H.264 is variable bit, variable bit rate. Uh, it has um, variable frame rate uh, and, and variable coding profiles and variable all kinds of other stuff. So saying that it's bit four uh, an asterisk doesn't, I mean, what does that say about it? Not really a whole lot. Uh, so it kind of limits the functionality we can include for video and, and asterisk. Um, but we changed that in asterisk 10 and greater. So um, formats are now represented by a format ID along with um, any set of custom attributes that could be associated with the format. So in this case, we have ULaw, which is still going to be just represented by an ID because there's no formats associated with ULaw, really. But H.264, we can take advantage of this. And we can say, all right, well, you have a format ID that represents this H.264, but now you have you know, frame rate and resolution and coding profile, and now you can do things like negotiating based upon these attributes and uh, possibly someday even uh, transcoding because um, we know what the two formats are. So it just kind of blows the roof off what asterisk can do in the future, uh, even if it's not being taken advantage of um, quite yet. Wow, that's the end. I blew through that stuff. <laughs> you guys have any questions? Yeah. So I don't have to repeat the question. Talking about the media format stuff? That's in every version of Asterisk. That's kind of, yeah, that's the fundamentals of how Asterisk was built. Um, yeah. Um, so frame hooks were specific to Asterisk 8. Um, Everything else I talked about is going to be in 1.4, um, except for the media stuff, and that's in Asterisk 10. So the, the two things I talked about that you aren't going to get in 1.4 is uh, the frame hooks and um, the, the new me media format um, representation. Um, yeah, I mean, so every single one of those Kodak modules, um, you can choose whether to load them or not. And by not loading them, you have disabled that path. Um, so if you don't have a A-Law to U-Law translator, then you, you can't do it. And if you don't, I mean, if you have a call that tries to get bridged between A-Law and U-Law, Asterisk is going to say, well, I, I can't do that. And it's going to probably just tear down the call. Um, but yeah, you can definitely disable that if you'd like. Anyone? Okay, so you would prefer it just not translate? Yeah, yeah well, just that's probably something you could figure out outside. Sure, sure. Question. So, any other questions? I thought I saw free hands. Yeah, you guys are okay. There's a question. Uh, release date for one dot ten. Um, very soon, <laughs> like in the next couple of weeks. Uh, maybe even sooner than that. I don't know. Does anyone have an exact date? I, I think, did we get release candidate one out? Yes, we did. So uh, I, it's imminent. Like. Uh, I'm not in control over that. I yeah, that's, that's that project's, that's whether they're going to, what, when they're going to release it and allow you know, access to it, that's a project outside of Digium, and we have no control of that, so. Question, well, I missed the first Sorry. question. So the question was about uh, when Asterisk 10 is going to be put in Elastics or free, free PPX or something like that. We, we don't, 
Yeah, we don't control those projects. That's right, whatever they want to put it in there, I guess. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Do you have, uh, do you have any option for uh, auto discovery, you know? I'm sorry, what was the question? For auto discovery, like if I plug in um, Polycom phones, you know, so it, uh, if I give the MAC address, then, you know, it configures itself. Oh, uh, I see what you're saying, like phone provisioning. provisioning. Uh -huh. um, we have a phone provisioning module, uh, res phone, phone prov. prov. Uh, I've never used it. I, I believe it does what you're wanting to do, where you can configure it in some sort of config file at your phones, and, hmm. um, and they'll Pol configure Polycom. themselves. Um, have you ever used it? Before yeah, I, I've used it briefly. It's uh, essentially when the phone attempts to register to Asterisk, it will also try to pull down information from the res phone prov. So it allows you to essentially auto provision your phone so that when they try to connect the first time, it'll say, oh, I recognize that MAC address or however you're trying to connect. Push down information like essentially Polycom firmware or whatever onto the phone. Do all your configuration as if it was pulling from FTP or HTTP or whatever. I think it's over HTTP. And then it then connects to the channel driver. What, how much time? We still got five minutes. Yeah, questions, anything. Three minutes. Wow. Questions everywhere now. You guys are holding back. <laughs> how active is the, um, you guys have a lot of database integration and we do a lot of stuff with Microsoft technologies. How active is your, specifically the TDS portion of that? Are you guys actively developing and if so how do you what what test process do you guys and this may be for Bellinger too I don't know what test process do you guys use to to sort of build that and test it and find bugs and things like that TDS right what does that stand for the tabular data stream uh, I'm not really there, there is a res, um, I think it's res config TDS or something to that effect, but essentially all of that database integration is essentially we try to do through ODBC now um, ODBC is quite active and has been tested very thoroughly. There are some native channel drivers like to do TDS and Postgres and MySQL and stuff. It pretty much always comes down to you want to use ODBC because it's just a lot better integration. It's that the way. most supported. It's uh, the most supported is right. really what it comes down to. We've just had some, some issues where we've been using a, like CEL, like channel event logs, mm -hmm. like you're talking about channels. Right. And catching all those events and stuff where it would lock up certain systems and things like that. So we've opened tickets and gone through the forums. And okay. How, so I think I might have seen your bug. What's that? Yeah, I think I might. Did you report it on uh, Jira? Uh, no, I went through the. I guess there's paid for tickets and stuff okay. like that. Okay. Yeah. But how active is that? The development, further development of the other Microsoft technologies for interacting with Azure. Not very. It's Not pretty much active. all ODBC um, is really where it comes down to. Just there's no. Um, there's no developer that has really just kind of come along and said, hey, I love TDS and that's what I'm going to program on. That's essentially what it comes down to. Um, there's always a developer that, you know, kind of picks a module or picks a pair of modules or whatever that they're really kind of responsible for and no one's really come along and been, hey, TDS or, you know, Microsoft, MSSQL and things like that, right? So. Two minutes. More questions. Uh, res foam prov. Yeah, it's in the res folder of the asterisk source tree. Yes. So we don't introduce new features into our release branches. So like 1.8 is feature frozen. We can't uh, put any new features into it. Same thing with 1. or sorry, asterisk 10 at this point as well. Uh, once it's branched, no new features go into it. Anything that changes behavior um, is considered a feature, I, I would say, at the base level. Or anything that adds new functionality as well. Um, so if you want to add a new feature into asterisk, um, uh, just submit the patch on our um, you know, issues.asterisk.org slash Jira, and um, we might have some feedback. We might tell you to put it on a review board or something like that. If it's really simple, we might just be able to commit it right away. But a lot of times, we'll have some feedback and say, well, you know, I see what you're trying to do, and um, that makes sense. I know why you want to do it, uh, but there's a different approach for it that fits within our architecture a little bit better, and will help guide people through that. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. So um, right at this point, so thanks, David, for uh, your presentation. 
Um, at this point, at this point, we have a 15-minute break. I think there are drinks and other various things. Um, we will start exactly at in 15 minutes because um, we have like four presentations to get through in an hour 45. So, see you back in 15.